In this video, I'm going to talk about the different ways in which one can forward packets that are transmitted over the air into the backend network. And I'm going to cover some diverse aspects here. Um, how packets from uh, different wireless SSIDs can be put on different VLANs or GRE tunnels, and also how uh, mobility is handled from an IP perspective. So we're going to talk about mobility within a particular controller domain and also mobility across controller domains. So to begin with, it is important to understand how SSIDs, which are the wireless services to which users connect, can be mapped to a backend network. And very briefly, the idea is as follows. And I'm going to draw first a logical picture of the Meru wireless LAN. There is a controller. And the controller connects to access points, which might be either local or remote, through either layer 2 or layer 3. Now, access points establish layer 2 or layer 3 tunnels between themselves and the controller. And the data packets from clients are transmitted back and forth within this tunnel. The controller is the central point to which all the wireless packets come in. And when the packets come into the controller, they can be put on multiple VLANs, depending upon policy mapping. So when we have an SSID, which is a wireless service, the default way in which packets are mapped on from the wireless network to the wired network is by mapping an SSID to a VLAN. And a controller has multiple ports. And therefore, you know, we have VLANs mapped to either the primary or the secondary port. So it's really a combination of VLAN and port mapping. It is also possible to not just map packets to a particular VLAN, but to actually map them to a GRE tunnel so that they can be further dropped off at a different location somewhere else in the enterprise. So we're going to talk about the GRE-based tunnel mapping as a refinement of how you do VLAN mapping. But the summary is that by, start, you know, we, by default, we start by mapping an SSID to a VLAN or indeed a GRE, which in turn are mapped to specific ports. Now, while this is the default mapping, an SSID might either be what we call in tunneled mode or in bridged mode. In a tunneled mode, all the packets that are going over the wireless network will go through the tunnel from the AP into the controller. In the controller, they'll get mapped to the VLAN or GRE. That's a standard. However, you might have situations where you have a faraway AP or let us say a home access point that might also have some tunnel traffic but maybe it has multiple SSIDs where some traffic needs to be tunneled and other traffic is locally bridged. So on a per SSID basis, you could either do tunneling or bridging. Tunneling is default, but bridging allows the option of having a local drop off of the particular of corresponding to that SSID. Now what this enables, of course, from a use case perspective is that your employees in, in, a, in an uh, enterprise can take access points home, they plug in the access points, the access points are centrally managed by a controller, and multiple SSIDs can be applied on this access point where some SSIDs will tunnel packets all the way back into the corporate network, other SSIDs will bridge packets locally. That allows, for example, an employee to take the laptop and their wireless phone home and still always re remain a part of the enterprise network while the family can connect to the network and at the same time just get the packets bridged out. So this is one level of abstraction where you do tunneling or bridging. The second level, of course, we already talked about for all the tunnel packets. That's the default. They'll get put on multiple VLANs or GRE. Now you could ask the question, what happens in an enterprise where you have multiple controllers? And maybe not all the VLANs are visible on all the controllers. So you could have, for example, VLAN 1 here and only VLAN 2 here. 
what happens to a user who moves from an access point connected to this controller to an access point that's connected to a different controller. So as the user moves from here to here, what happens? Now, of course, there are two ways in which one can configure the system. You could think of these two controller domains as being essentially independent domains so that the connectivity is specified within the context of a controller. But for a large enterprise, it makes a lot of sense to think of all of these controllers as essentially providing one clustered view, even though they are in different subnets and they do not have the same VLANs mapped to them. So in this particular case, when a client comes in and gets mapped on an initial controller based on the access point that they come in, they'll get mapped on a particular VLAN. As they move to a different controller, packets for the same client from the second controller actually get tunneled back on the first controller. So while the user is in the domain of controller one, packets go this way. As the user moves from controller one to controller two, notice that the packets go through this tunnel. There's communication across these controllers using Meru's intercontroller roaming feature. So controller two knows that this device actually showed up on controller one, and in that case, takes the packets and pushes them back, and it goes out V1. This way, regardless of which controller domain a user is in, from an IP perspective, their connectivity is always preserved. So now we have all the uh, individual factoids, if you will, uh, on our hand in order to put together the entire mobility picture or the packet forwarding picture. Let's start top down. You have an enterprise that has multiple controllers. Within each controller, you have multiple access points. And these access points may be on the same or different subnets. They may be on campus or they may be off campus. And you have users who have to connect on campus in a particular AP, moving within a controller, or across controller domains, or they connect from on campus to off campus. How do we handle all of these? So as you can see, SSIDs are mapped to either tunneled or bridged, in which case the drop-off points are either right at the access point or go back to the controller. The bridge scenario particularly makes sense in the context of the home. And notice tunneling or bridging is a property of an SSID, not an access point. So in fact, an access point with multiple SSIDs can give different treatment to different packets based on how they've been provisioned. And of course, access points are always centrally provisioned. So now, with respect to bridge traffic, it always goes to a controller. When a user gets into the domain of a controller, or the first time the user connects, they get an IP address based on you know, this policy mapping. As they move between access points on the same controller, even if, they are, even if the access points are in different subnets, notice that the client always lands its packets on the same controller. Therefore, there is no concept of roaming at that point in terms of IP. Packets always land on the same controller, and hence they go to the same VLAN. As the client moves to a different controller domain, these controllers are talking to each other, so they figure it out, and packets are piped back to the original controller, and that way the client always retains its IP address. 